Hey, sweetheart, it's Rowan, and first let me get some music started, but let me make sure that the volume is where it ought to be, because I don't want this to overpower my the melodious sound of my voice. Uh, let's bring that down there to win amp. Now, uh, first let me introduce the music that you will hear in the background of this video. This is Premature Ejaculation, which was the industrial noise project of Ross Williams that he pretty much, uh, depending on where you read the timeline and just remember uh, even the official timeline on uh, rosnet.com, uh, this, is, this is based on what people remember. <laughs> This is based on what people remember, so, you know, assume that certain dates will be approximate. Um, but uh, he was doing this between roughly 1979-1980 until literally his last album was uh, Wound of Exit, uh, which was a premature ejaculation record. Uh, that's also what inspired me to... Oh, this, this got beautifully messed up. Um... My, uh, my Polaroids with the um, heavily mangled um, developments. Uh, I don't think this is done developing yet, but I, I am loving more and more when I do these. Uh, this, was, this was, as you can tell from the, you know, my laundry out on the line uh, just about maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. Uh, usually I go unscripted, usually I go unscripted, but a lot of people have been making videos about it because it happened two weeks ago, and it's so sad. But, um, I'm gonna go on, <laughs> um, for a bit. I've scripted this, the, um, the, the, the original text, which, you know, I'm not going to stick to this exactly, but when you see my eyes darting up at the screen, um, behind my, uh, f phone camera, and that's what I'm doing. I'm looking to, you know, like, m keep myself as close to on script as possible. Uh, this is going to be why I'm actually kind of glad that Bat's Day in the Fun Park is over. It's over. You've heard about it. You've heard about it. It was going about 20 years. This was the 20th and allegedly final. I guess, like, there's been some speculation about how much of this is actually due to the, um... The, uh, the, the Republican tax plan that went through this year that uh, at least the, uh, the Bats Day organizers are saying, oh, due to the tax plan, we can't do this another year. This is going to be the last year. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, whether or not this is actually going to be the last year um, is anybody's guess, depending on, like, what they can do to try and make it happen. Hopefully it's the last year. I really wish it's the last year. And I'm going to tell you why. Because... Honestly, it was never intended to be, like, I, when I lived in Los Angeles, I was, um, I was fairly young, but I was also much closer than I am now to the people who originally, um, started Bats Day in the Fun Park, which was 1999, it was originally supposed to be just a one-off thing, this was just supposed to be a one-off thing, it was gonna be happening once, and as kind of a joke, it was intended to just be, be a lark for some dumb reason, because, you know, in Southern California, it is hard to avoid Disney. If you've seen Venture Brothers, you know, there's, there's the Brisby theme park and the, uh, and, and the Orange County Liberation Front, and that's really not too far off from how ubiquitous Disney is in, um, in, uh, in Orange County and, you know, the general Los Angeles, Anaheim area. It is... It, it is everywhere. It is hard to escape. So this was just kind of started, you know, that late 90s ironic humor before, like, hipsters went and ruined it like they do everything. Oh my gosh, I love this photo more and more as it's developing. It's, uh, it's, I don't think it's fully developed yet, but oh god, I love it. I love it. Um, so this is supposed to be a one-off thing, and there's now been 20. There's been 20 from what started as a joke. This started as a joke, 
and then it kind of became, you know, okay, well, let's take this joke and actually, like, you know, meet up and freak out the normies at Disneyland for shits and giggles, you know, it'll be a one-off thing, and, you know, then they got kind of organized about it, but it was, it was never intended to be more than a one-off thing, that's what it was, it was just like, this is our joke, this is our joke, and it snowballed from there, and it's been taken over by... Uh, somebody who is not Dave, who is not Dave, and, you know, the other people who was with it. Uh, so it was taken over in, like, 2001, 2002-ish, and it's been run by that same character ever since, and so, uh, so I gotta say, you know, especially on Reddit, I spent a lot of time on the, uh, on the Argoth Reddit sub, which, you know, it's just a forum. Um, you know, there is no, you know, um, unified Reddit community, and as much as people like to give, um, Reddit shit, especially people on Tumblr, you like to give Reddit shit when, really, it's no worse than Tumblr, and in many ways it's actually kind of better, because there are literal Nazis on Tumblr, and since, um, and, you know, since, um, um, shit, I forget her name, but, uh, since, since she, um, was ousted from, no, she quit, didn't she? Um, and she actually was the one that, you know, was just like, no, let's just, like, you know, let it be a free-for-all until people really start, you know, um, you know, breaking some, breaking some hardcore, like, legal rules. Um, so, yeah, like, after she, after she left Reddit, um, they started cracking down on the more toxic subs, so it's like, you don't even get literal Nazis on Reddit anymore, or, you know, the, the form that they do take, like, you know, their incels form has come back in, you know, a similar form, but, you know, they, they've mostly moved off of Reddit, um... Uh, but, uh, but no, Tumblr, you get literal Nazis. Reddit, not so much anymore, right? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, like, I've seen a lot of people on Reddit go on, like, oh, Goth Evolved from Punk, and uh, you see it on YouTube as well, Goth Evolved from Punk, and, you know, for as much as people like to stress that, especially these days, I didn't see this quite as much in the late 90s myself anyway, but I see it a lot these days, more than I'm used to. And, you know, I, I would say that, you know, seeing goth came out of punk is a gross oversimplification of everything that um, came together to create what is now currently the goth subculture, though musically, the music genre came from punk. But as a subculture, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, but, uh, but I digress. So, you know, for every one of these people going on about how goth came from punk, you've got at least one or two other people who, you know, have either, who are either reminiscing about past Bats days and lamenting that they couldn't be at the final one, or they're lamenting that they'll never be able to attend a Bats day ever now, or somehow just otherwise, you know, uh, speculating exactly how much of this had to do with the tax plan or whatever and you know you know and how much of it was actually like behind the scenes stuff that people are staying mute on um but the fact of the matter is um that stay wasn't just an ironic joke of a gathering of goths at Disneyland it was an overhyped joke that went way too far, way farther than it ever was intended to go, and blossomed into Guffs embracing everything that those punk roots everybody loves to extol the virtues of. You know, it's extolling. You know, it, it's doing. It, it it's Guffs coming together in a place that stands for everything. You know, Guffs punk roots stood against. <laughs> and let, let me tell you a little bit. Um, so it's hard to fling a dead bat without hitting some personal account from some former employee of either Disney Studios or their theme parks going into as much detail as they are legally allowed to do. <laughs> this is important. 
um, about how badly the media giant mistreats their employees and private contractors who are basically employees in every meaningful sense except due to some loophole where Disney can get out of paying the employee what they're worth and you know, also get out of paying things like severance and pension when they're done exploiting these contract workers. <sighs> so, yep, there we go. There's that anarcho-communist spirit espoused by Vice-Subversa, sub, vice the, <laughs> the, the front woman of Poison Girls, who was literally the mother of early goth band Rubella Ballet. The literal mother of an early goth band was an anarcho-punk. Mull on this. Mull on this, sweethearts. So it's become increasingly talked about in other avenues, especially on YouTube, about how Disney is redefining copyright law so that their company can become increasingly more rich, powerful, and exploitative. And they've done this pretty much you know, since the 60s, Disney has worked steadfast at trying to redefine copyright law to be more exploitative than it was ever intended to be. And what people really don't address is how this has the potential to effectively destroy all creative fields and how it actively harms independent artists. Without DIY ethics behind the creative forces, we'd have no punk arguably no goth, and copyright law, you know, no longer exists for creative people. It exists for those who exploit creativity. The need for copyright law came about in the early 20th century, and the earliest versions of this, you know, were generally benign, and arguably good. And had they stayed that way, you know, we would be living in a much more fair and decent landscape toward artists and creatives of all disciplines. Now, to really illustrate how badly this was needed, let's look at Charles Dickens. What's this got to do with goth? I'll explain it in a sec. Uh, what, you know, or... More accurately, what's this got to do with copyright, since that's this chapter of this video? Uh, Charles Dickens, um, and his, Im you know, pretty much immediately popular novella, A Christmas Carol. Yes, it was pretty popular right away, though, like many of his works, it was written to draw attention to the plight of the working poor, and this facet is pretty much lost on nearly all adaptations of the work for, you know, film and theater. Uh, and in the 19th century, you know, this meant that because his work, you know, because A Christmas Carol was so popular so fast, it was heavily pirated, and there was practically nothing that Dickens nor his publishers could do about it other than to discourage shopkeepers from buying the unauthorized publications of A Christmas Carol, you know, so the pirated copies, you know, please don't buy the pirated copies, please buy our authorized copy from the authorized publisher. And, you know, since the pirated, since the pirated copies could be available much more cheaply, this meant that Charles Dickens, at some point, he realized the only way he was going to make money off of A Christmas Carol was to give seasonal readings of it, which he'd get very theatrical about it. He'd do, like, these wildly different voices for all the different characters, and, you know, he'd bring out props and whatnot, and there would be some people, like, you know, making, like, the chain rattling noises and stuff. You know, but... You know, if you think he would have rather done that than, you know, focus his attention on other works and, you know, just let this, you know, th this little, you know, story that's, you know, even, you know, reading it, it's a, a bit subtle about how it's bringing attention to the plight of the working poor. Um, you know, it has stronger themes of you know, of recanting this for redemption, you know, but, um, you know, which is why it's so easily to ignore that angle in the book, uh, you know, it, for adaptations, but, um, 
you know. But if, if you think he he would he would have rather the, the book just speak for itself and make money off of it, you know, he would have rather done that. He would have rather just you know not had to do these, or at least not to the extent that he ended up doing them, just so he could make money off of his own work. <laughs> Uh, so, the earliest copyright laws assured that a creator would have the sole rights to make any income off of their work for either the duration of the artist's life, you know, or the writers, the composers, you know, whatever, or, you know, or for 50 years after its creation, whichever came first, you know, for up to 50 years or the duration of your lifetime, which, you know, we're talking late 19th, very early 20th century, most people didn't you know, even still, you know, in in the U.S., the uh, the the, um, the median life expectancy in the West is still about 75, 77 years old. So, considering that most people don't crank out their first novel before they're 25, even now, you know, that's still guaranteeing the your lifespan. You will make money off of this. So, that's original copyright law. At some point. They extended this a bit because, you know, there were people dying younger before their work really got recognized, and there were, you know, who would basically be heirs, you know, the children, you know, who, you know, d you know, who lived, you know, when their, you know, creative parent died younger, so the child dies, you know, or the parent dies before the child reaches adulthood, but the parent wrote a, a novel that got really popular shortly after their death. How is the kid going to, you know, benefit from, you know, from this, you know, they're basically being left uncared for financially. So, copyright laws then, you know, went, okay, the artist's life plus 50 years, then plus the artist's life plus 80 years. Even still, it's like, okay, you know, this exists so that your heir can be taken care of, you know, should you die before your work gets really popular, if it ever does. You know, but still, even if it doesn't get really popular, you know, your kid can still, like, republish your work, you know, and have claim to that within their life, you know, you know, and just say, you know, hey, this, you know, I'm just publishing this in hopes that maybe, you know, I'll get $10 a month, you know, <laughs> even in today's money. <laughs> so when when you're really poor, that $10 can mean the difference between getting the lights shut off or not. So, so with the um, advent of the film industry, this meant that copyright got a little bit tricky. Unlike, you know, books or, you know, even pieces of music where it can, you know, or an art piece or illustrations for the books, um, you know, where it can be concretely said, you know, this one or two people you know, created this piece, and that's the end of that. That is who owns, you know, the, the intellectual rights to this. Film gets a little bit more tricky because, you know, sure, you have the script writer, um, and you have the director and producer, you know, who are a bit more hands-on than the, than, the, than, the, than the script writer usually um, is. Um, so, who can be, who can really say? And plus, you've got actors who, you know, let's face it, it's... Actors are to um, film as watercolors or, pa or oil paints are to, you know, a canvas artist. So, um, so, you know, a lot of studios, you know, worked out contracts where actors, you know, it's technically work for hire, it's technically work for hire, you know, it's the screenwriter and director and producer that, you know, technically created this. They just told you what to do to be a part of this creation. And, you know, fine, you can argue about the, you know, ethics of that until you're blue in the face. So, Disney then, what about it? Disney has been instrumental in extending copyright to the exploitative depths, depths it currently exists in, and they've done the some of the most hypocritical. They've done this in some of the most hypocritical ways imaginable. Uh, Walt Disney first really made a name for himself in the 1928 so short subject animated film Steamboat Willie, which was a derivative work of the Buster Keaton film Steamboat Bill Jr. Uh, I mean, Mickey Mouse cartoon is practically the Mickey Mouse cartoon is practically 
a fan fiction level of gentle parody of the then more popular live action silent film. Uh, um, so, what's Disney's relationship with fan fiction and other derivative works now? You know, as in the corporation. It's not very friendly, is it? I mean, you cannot sample Disney films um, for YouTube reviews. Reviews are legally protected by copyright, but um, the more savvy YouTube channels will sample exactly, you know, like, you know, the, the seven to ten seconds that, you know, the, the minimum allowable by law for review. But most reviewers on YouTube are not that savvy, and so they, they just don't sample Disney at all, because they don't want to have to support this, you know, which, you know, ultimately comes down to, you know, you know, to support to support their right to, you know, take clips for purposes of review, which is legally allowed, um, you know, a minimum of seven to ten seconds. I think it's, uh, some people say seven, some people say ten. I, it, it's been a while since I've actually looked over the laws there. But, you know, most people would agree that, you know, even taking like a twenty second, you know, even taking like five twenty second clips from the film, you know, to review, you know, you know, certain plot points, most filmmakers would not, ha tend to not have a problem with this. They're just like, hey, you know, it's advertising we don't pay for. <laughs> it's advertising we don't pay for, you know, especially with older films, you know, you're get you're generating interest in these older films. Sure, have a blast. Have a blast with this, you know, you know, we could prosecute, but you know, that, that film's 20 years old. Have, a, have fun with it. Disney, on the other hand, like, you, you can't take more than seven seconds of Cinderella, a film that is, like, 55 years old, that, you know, I mean, yeah, everybody's heard of it, everybody's seen it, but still, you know, you can't take more than that much, you know, to build a review, like, you know, even a compare and contrast review, you, you, you know, Disney won't let you do that. You know, and, you know, the only times they basically let people do that is when, you know, it's been proved that this, you know, um, film reviewer on YouTube, you know, knows just as much about copyright law as Disney does. <laughs> so, you have to really prove yourself to be able to sample Disney for a review. You have, you know, and, um... You know, and so derivative works, Disney will squash that. The only reason I don't think they squash cosplay is because, you know, cosplayers are very seldom making money off of this, and those who can make money off of cosplay, um, you know, being hired as, you know, basically, you know, to go to, you know, one of the, you know, basically, you know, like some of the bigger conventions do hire cosplayers to go around for photo ops with people and to, you know, help. Um, promote the event and get pe get more people interested in going so they can go look at the cosplayers. Um, you know, there are, there are provisions in these contracts stating you cannot cosplay anything owned by Disney um, and, you know, work the convention. You know, they will not hire that. If you see people at a convention cosplaying something owned by Disney, they're working on their own and, you know, if they are accepting money for pictures, they probably shouldn't be. Um, please don't tell people about that if they are, uh, because um, you know, you know, they're not making money off of it. You know, there's no way that they can make money off of this. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, Mickey Mouse. Um, since I was mentioning him, and we're talking about copyright, so. Copyright, so after ex copyright is supposed to expire, it and, you know, the work then enters the public domain. Meaning, you know, it's no longer piracy if you want to, like, publish, you know, like, cheap copies of, you know, classic literature, like, you know, like Frankenstein, you know, or uh, uh, Castle of the Toronto. Um, you know, you can, you know, um, Penguin and whatever, they, pu they publish cheap-ass copies of these, and, you know, it's... 
you know, to to a large extent, you know, the 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 cheap ass, you know, public domain, you know, reprints they do, it, they pay for themselves. They pay for themselves, and you know, they they keep you know interest in these works alive. Um, uh, but uh, but now Mickey Mouse was originally supposed to enter the public domain in 1998. 20 years ago, Mickey Mouse was supposed to be enter the public domain. And the research I did for this uh, currently suggests that, you know, he should enter the public domain for real this time, we hope, <laughs> for real this time, in 2024. So we've got maybe another six years before Mickey Mouse is public domain. But he was supposed to be public domain 20 years ago. And why? And that is because, uh... <sighs> Where did I go with this? Um... Uh, this, this basically... There are people who've explained a lot better than I ever could is, um... You know, basically, um, Walt Disney has basically pushed Congress to extend their copyright on Mickey Mouse. Uh, to, you know, another now going on 26 years, and he might enter the public domain. Uh, so, uh, then there's the fact that Walt Disney Studios, and so by extension, many characters in its theme parks... You know, all of their best known and best beloved animated features, you know, almost all of them. I think Moana is mostly original. Um, though Lindsay Ellis did a really good video about how it basically rehashes Pocahontas. <laughs> well, it more was about how Pocahontas is a mistake, but, you know, um, they corrected a lot of the mistakes of Pocahontas with Moana. And, you know, I can, I can see how it's basically the same story, just different setting of indigenous, of different indigenous peoples. Uh, so, you know, all of the, you know, like, the, the entire Disney Golden Age, most of the Disney Renaissance, you know, are based on stories that have long been in the public domain. And maybe all of the Disney Renaissance, um, depending on how far back you go with the Disney Renaissance, um, let's see, um, so, uh, so yeah, um, you know, even, like, you know, you've got stories like Cinderella or Snow White or Sleep or The Sleeping Beauty, you know, that were later compiled by the Grimm's Brothers, but a lot of these stories go back even further than that, like, go, go back centuries before that with so many localized versions. The Grimm's just consolidated a version, but even then, like, the Grimm's version was long in the public domain by the time uh, Walt Disney made films of, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and Cinderella and The Sleeping Beauty. And, um, uh, and, you know, um, and then you've got the Disney Renaissance, you know, which took, you know, film, you know, you know, which took stories that, you know, where we know the authors, we know the authors, you know, it's not something like, you know, like Grimm, com like the Grimm's Brothers compiling folk tales. This is, you know, we've got, you know, um, uh, Hans Christian Andersen wrote The Little Mermaid and Disney wrecked it. Affected so bad. Um, um, Hans Christian Andersen also wrote *The Snow Queen*, which was a bit more loosely adapted into *Frozen*. Um, and then we've got uh, Gabrielle Suzanne de de, de Villeneuve, uh, who wrote in 1740 *Beauty and the Beast*. So um, again, these are all works that have been public domain, and. Disney has used the public domain to its advantage on so many levels, and yet has been really stingy about letting anything it's done get into, lapse into the public domain. So, <laughs> so this is the most hypocritical thing, and when you look at the punk ethos, you know, we've not only got, you know, the anti-capitalist angle, you know, which, you know, uh, you know the, the purest form of, of anti-capitalism is anarcho-communism. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, so, so when you get to these punk roots with the, with the anarcho-punks, you know, who 
in some cases literally gave birth to gothic rock. Um, you know, th this is, you know, we, we, you can't get any further from these punk roots than Disney. And uh, so this is not a company that nurtures creativity. Uh, I mean, y you've seen what they've done with Tim Burton, right? All of his worst stuff has been linked with Disney. Um, at least, you know, after uh, uh, Black Cauldron, though arguably also Black Cauldron, with, with, with the exception of at least the original live-action Frankenweenie, uh, everything bad of Tim Burton's is connected to Disney. This is, this is a company that does not like creativity. I mean, you know, Sweeney Todd, you know, his, his version of the, of the, you know, Sondheim, um, you know, musical, that was brilliant. That's one of the most brilliant things he's ever done. Uh, Big Fish, nobody liked Big Fish but me after it first came out. Now people, you know, see what the, what the latest Alice movies are, and they're just, like, and so they're looking back, like, was, was Burton, you know, actually good and like oh yeah Burton was great even Big Fish is good everybody hated Big Fish when it first came out except for me I loved Big Fish Tim Burton but like everything bad he's done everything that I can say is actually bad was something he's done with Disney and um and uh uh so uh where was I going okay so you know more th you know more than that Punk as a subculture, more than a subgenre of rock music, has seldom cared about copyright laws. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, so let's look at this. Like, early in the formation of hip-hop as a musical genre, literally the only clubs in New York City, literally the only clubs in New York City, like, this wasn't getting played on, you know, on, on um, you know, at the, uh, at, at, at the, at the, at the black clubs, this, you know, like, like, you know, which were mostly playing disco music, and, like, good disco music. We're talking, the only clubs in New York City that would play hip-hop records were the punk clubs. So, the, the, you know, the rap records, the hip-hop records, were getting played at the punk clubs. These were, you know, there are documentaries about this, and they're saying, oh, yeah, the, the, the punk kids were the only ones who would play our records at the clubs, you know, and get people dancing to it. <laughs> Um, and sampling and hip-hop have kind of gone hand-in-hand hand since day one of hip-hop as a genre. Um, and then there's the fact that, you know, you get further into the punk roots, you know, we've got Roz Williams, which brings me to why I'm playing Premature Ejaculation in the background, which you can barely hear, can you? Um, you might be able to hear it better than me, uh, because I've got the, because the mic on the phone is right up there. So, uh, so, <laughs> you know, um... You know, this relies, you know, um, a lot of punks, um, you know, so we've got, um, what's it called, um, Roz Williams with Premature Ejaculation, we've got The Deep End, I've got a couple albums from them where, you know, um, Fate Fatal and basically whoever else is in The Deep End this, this year, <laughs> that's The Deep End, <laughs> is Fate Fatal and whoever else he can, you know, decide is in The Deep End this year. Uh, Skinny Puppy, Ministry, and many other punk, death rock, industrial, um, and possibly to a lesser extent, though, correct me if I'm wrong, gothic rock, you know, they, heavy, they sample heavily from film, television, and even other musicians, um, but you can't sample from Disney. <laughs> you can't sample from Disney, they will find you, they will destroy you. Um, they, they will come from you, and you will... And you'll be lucky if you're even allowed to cover it. Um, because, you know, if you're even allowed to cover any of the songs from Disney films as a musician. Um, you know, I've, I've noticed, at least for a long time, the only times I'll see covers of Disney songs at all are on authorized compilations from Disney. I don't think... I don't even think they allow people to cover their songs independently without it being part of an official Disney release. Like, you can't, um, oh wait, no, no, Trust in Me's been covered a couple times, but only, um, you know, um, Susie, uh, Sue had Geffen Records really backing her up on that, so, um, so she had the strength of a major label 
to, you know, be able to cover a song from a Disney film, you know, and not have it on a compilation. I even forgot that was Disney for a second. So think about this, like, oh, you know, you have to either be one of the biggest names in the business or be backed by one of the biggest labels in the business to even cover a Disney song, <laughs> you know, on your own record. And, uh, and speaking of premature ejaculation again, so, uh, uh, there are still some circles on the internet who may still regard me as the Roz Williams fan, although there have been people contesting that title of mine. Uh, I arguably retired it for a few years, but, um, I, I am here to reclaim this, so, um, premature ejaculation. For most of the existence of this project of Roz Williams, uh, the music was released on home cassette tapes under the label name uh, Happiest Place on Earth, or at least for the first two years it was called Happiest Place on Earth, and then Disney got wind of that, and, and especially got wind of uh, Ros Williams' collage piece of the same name, Happiest Place on Earth, which juxtaposes Disney icons with Nazi imagery um, and um, images from, you know, concentration camps and refugee camps and war and famine. Uh, so obviously it's not the most favorable depiction there, is it? No, it's not. Um, so, uh, so there was a cease and desist put on, you know, calling the home tape label happiest place on earth. So, um, Disney pretty much did PE a favor by letting them use the name happiest tapes on earth. And, I mean, they probably could have prosecuted further and gotten away with it. But they're just like, eh, it's a basement company, what are we going to do other than, like, you know, completely destroy them? So, uh, but, you know, if it was somebody, you know, who had a bit of a bigger name, you bet their ass, you bet your ass they would have pushed that even harder than they did. Uh, so, the fact... And then, you know, and th now that we're done with all of the copyright and how Disney is just purely evil, and, you know, nobody who espouses punk roots in their right mind should want to have anything to do with Disney, um, much less directly give them money through their theme park, um, uh, there's the fact that the primary attraction for Bat's Day has literally always been about the fashion. You know, if you care more about the music, or e even as much about the music as you do about showing off your clothes, Bat's Day w wasn't really for you. You, you, you know, uh, you know, sure, the organizers eventually added a live music and DJ event, but that was after practically a decade of unofficial pre-parties at some club or another, and some well-deserved criticism from, um, from others about, about how it was basically a three-day fashion show with some off-schedule events. You'd have to leave the park and drive, you know, about an hour to go see. <laughs> uh, and, you know, um, and then there was the fact that it was literally the most expensive major goth event anywhere in the world. Uh, so first off, like, Bat's Day in the Fun Park was never an official Disney-sponsored event, meaning you had to pay on, you, you had to pay to get into the Fun Park. You had to pay to get into the park. And, you know, that was, that was all well and good. When it was just a one-shot, one-day, Bat's Day, singular day, it used to be a single day, and it eventually expanded to three days for... Um, so, um, you know, the, you know, when it was still just a one-off thing, it's like, oh, okay, whatever. Just, you know, waste some money on Disney, you know, to be there for one day, it's a day, whatever. Um, so, uh, so... Then what was I going with this? Um, so you you have to pay to get into the park, and you know since it's now three days, you have to pay for the hotel, um, and they they really encourage people to you know like use the Disney hotel you know since it's like right there and you don't have to drive about an hour or so to get something that's a little bit more reasonable, 
and um, and you uh, uh, and then you had to pay for the event tickets themselves. So this was not a cheap event. This was not a cheap event. It was literally like in the last five years, it was literally the most expensive goth event <laughs> imaginable that was ever put on. So you know, the the people who would go were the people who could afford to go, which, you know, are people not necessarily representative of goth, especially if they're going because it's mostly just a fashion show at that point. You know, so you're not seeing people representative of goth. You're seeing people representative of how goths look, if that. Um... You know, you were seeing a lot of cosplayers at some point. You were, you know... Um... So, uh... So, yeah, like, you know, literally I just looked... At, I, I just l looked at everything up. You know, the, uh... The Gothic Cruise, which, you know, has... You know, which, you know, per, uh, cabin, whether, you know, you're getting the single interior cabin for, what was it, like, $950, um... You know, or the, uh, I think it's something like 1200 for the, uh, for, for the, uh, for the penthouse suite kind of cabin deal that's ocean view. Um, you, you know, when you consider that the Gothic Cruise is a week, that's, that's actually, like, far more affordable per day than Bat's Day in the Fun Park was for three days. You know, it's, you know, for each of its three days. So, um... So, you know, even when the, uh, the late 1990s ironic humor was still actually sort of cool, um, I always thought the idea of a bunch of goths gathering at Disneyland, even for one day, or any other, you know, major theme park, you know, as opposed to an amusement park, was kind of stupid, you know. I, I would make an exception for an amusement park like uh, Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio. They have annually, um, in September and October, their Halloween weekends, where they do up the, the park with Halloween decorations, and, yeah, that's about it. They do up the park with Halloween decorations, um, <laughs> and I've been to, been out there a couple times with a bunch of other goths just going to just, like, hang out and, you know, do things, um, but, you know, it's a much cheaper you know, it's a much cheaper thing to go to is the Hollow Weekends at Cedar Point. Um, especially when you consider that the tickets for, you know, a day pass are like half the price as they are during the summer, which is their peak times, which is, so it's like, you know, this is, you know, you're riding just as many roller coasters as you would be at Disneyland. Um, if you want, you know, it's just as family friendly as it is at Disneyland. You know, even the food is half the price as it is at Disneyland. Oh my gosh, that's the other thing. It's like golf cruise. Like, you're even getting fed most of, you know, most of your meals at the, uh, you know, on the boat. So the price includes you eating, you know, whereas Disney, oh, Disney is notorious. Like, they want you to hook up your credit card to this little bracelet that they'll scan, you know, at all of their restaurants, you know. And, yeah, you could, you know, I, I don't know if they give you, like, you know, like a 10% deal on this or whatever to do it that way, but... Uh, or, or if it just costs more, I don't know, I don't know, but it's like, you know, everything you do at Disneyland goes directly to Disney, and it costs you money, you know, it costs you money to do everything at Disneyland, um, so it's like you're paying to get into this park, and you're pretty much just paying to get into this park and, like, walk around and ride the rides, and, um, and even then, you've got different tiers of, you know, tickets, you know, to get in and ride the rides, uh, and mill about, um, you know, but you still have to pay for your food, and, you know, it's, a, it's literally the most, ex it's one of the most expensive things in the world, and they won't even feed you, <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, sure, it was family friendly, but, you know, it's at the cost of cultural integrity, and, you know, you're giving money directly to a massive corporate entity that is actively destroying creativity by destroying the public domain, 
you know, while at the same time exploiting the public domain. Um, so, I mean, cre you know, especially creativity of a nature that gods have historically and should still and continue, you know, to embrace. So, um, there should have never been anything about Bats Day in the Fun Park that could have been supported by the goth subculture. And it's one of the greatest shames, in my opinion, it is one of the greatest shames of the last 20 years of goth culture that, have, that has ever existed. So, now that I've said all I want to say about that, um, I hope you do have a wonderful evening, Dar dears, and bats and kisses, and I love you all so much.